Okay, welcome. Uh, International Women's Day, March the 8th, is a global day celebrating the social, economic, co cultural and political achievements of women. And the day also marks a call to action for accelerating women's equality. Today in the University of Birmingham School of Nursing, we have the absolute pleasure of celebrating International Women's Day with an inspirational woman and one of the most influential nurses in the history of the NHS who has spent her life championing equality. Professor Dame Elizabeth Annie Onwu had a disrupted childhood born here in Birmingham to two university students in the 1940s and started her journey being raised by nuns in a Catholic children's home. She overcame the stigma and the racism of the time having the dual heritage of an Irish mum and a Nigerian father to become a trailblazing nurse whose career has been sent, spent advancing nursing science and tackling inequality. As a nurse, a health visitor and an academic, Dame Elizabeth has always advocated for people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. She was a pioneer in the care of those with sickle cell disease and thalassemia, inherited conditions which affect patients from these backgrounds, becoming the first clinical nurse specialist for sickle cell and thalassemia, and helping the establishment of the first nurse-led service to meet these patient needs, patients' needs in 1979. Elizabeth has written and published extensively in this area, gaining a PhD in 1988, and later leading on the development of the RCN accredited framework for nurses caring for people with sickle cell and thalassemia. Elizabeth has also successfully campaigned for the Mary Seacole statue appeal, a campaign to have a statue of the Jamaican nurse Mary Seacole erected at St Thomas's Hospital in London. This was the first named memorial statue of a black woman in the UK and she was also immortalised in her book A Short History of Mary Seacole. Elizabeth has been extensively recognised and honoured for her services to nursing, including being presented with a Damehood in the 2017 Queen's New Year's Honours List, um, is a Fellow of the Queen's Nursing Institute, has been awarded a CBE for services to nursing, as well as a Fellowship of the Royal College of Nursing for the work around the development of nurse-led sickle cell and thalassemia services and education and leadership in transcultural nursing. In 2018, as part of the 70th anniversary National Health Service celebrations, Elizabeth was included in the list of the 70 most influential nurses and midwives in the history of the NHS. Elizabeth, who I do not mind confessing, is a personal hero of mine. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm fine, Lorna. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. I'm really, really excited and really honoured to be here having this conversation with you. Well, I'm, um, I'm delighted to have been invited. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you. I've got a few questions for you today. I've got some that have been sent from our students as well, who are really excited about um, sharing this interview on International Women's Day. Um, so I will make a start and I'll let you know which ones, which of the questions are from our students. So the theme of this year's International Women's Day is Break the Bias. And something that really struck me in your memoir, Dreams from My Mother, is that you're from a line of inspiring women who were not afraid to break the bias. So for example, your mother, Mary Furlong, was a first generation university student. And I just wondered if you could tell me a little bit about her. Yes, thank you very much. She's, she's now deceased, um, but as you said, she was, she, well, she was born at, she was actually born in Liverpool and then the family moved to Stafford, so um, in the Midlands. But her grandparents, so my great grandparents, were the emigrants from Ireland in the 1870s yeah. um, from County Wexford. For any Irish uh, students, maybe, or people who know about Ireland. So um, she was extremely bright and uh, as mentioned, she was the first person to go to university in her family and to a very prestigious university, Cambridge University, to study classics. Um, she had a huge love, it seemed, for Greek uh, mythology and um, hence the classics. And um, she was doing extremely well. She won a prize in her first year and she won a prize in the second year. And then she became pregnant with me. 
So I don't know whether you'd like me to stop there and, and ask another question to take it forward, or is that is that enough about my mother? It's yeah. So your your mother's story I find a very very fascinating and inspiring story, and the links between you and um, and um, and yes, and and so when she got pregnant with you, that did spell the unfortunately for her the end of her studies, didn't it? Well, she, interestingly enough, she could have gone back to university. The we have to remember we're talking about 1947, so just yeah. after the Second World War. So you have to remember attitudes towards single parents in those days and and also the fact that she came from a very religious family catholic family and so whenever you're looking at how a family deals with something you have to take in all those uh, background um, uh, features so the, the the university wasn't told that she was pregnant i mean there was so much shame and stigma about yeah single person being pregnant, a single woman being pregnant at that time. So the university were told that my mother had had a nervous breakdown and was in Ireland recuperating, which wasn't the case at all, but that was the excuse they gave to explain why my mother couldn't carry on her university studies at that point. But the plan was that once I was born, my mother would actually go back and complete her degree. But this is where a, a, a characteristic of my mother um, came out, her determination and obstinacy, in fact, to um, say, no, she always wanted to make a home for me. And that is the most crucial reason, I believe, that I have done well in life, that I never, ever, ever had any sense of rejection from my mother even though I ended up staying in a children's home for nine years. But my mother was a constant visitor and it was made clear as I sort of gradually got a little bit older, you know, probably maybe seven, eight, nine, that I wasn't going to stay in the children's home forever, that my mom wanted to uh, prepare a home for me. It took longer than she thought, but there was always that link with my mother. I never had any sense of, um, long-term separation from her at all that's really evident throughout your throughout your memoir and throughout your journey that sense of belonging and love from your mum um, and it, it's really wonderful to read about um, my next question Elizabeth is one of our was one from our students and it's about and it's a, a just a nice opening into your career really and it is what is it that inspired you to become a nurse well, I, what inspired me to become a nurse, I have to go back to my childhood in the children's home. It was run by Catholic nuns and I had very bad eczema. Uh, and also looking back, my asthma was starting to develop, but I was just called a chesty child in those days. Mm -hmm. So it was my eczema that took me to the sick bay a lot because I had just awful, awful eczema uh, in, on my arms behind my knees and uh, in those days they used to um, use something called coal tar paste which was very cooling beautiful on the red painful itchy skin and then they'd put gauze over that and then bandage it and that wasn't bad but when it came to changing the dressing that could be horrible because by this time the gauze had stuck to the coal tar cream because that had dried up and then the bandage was stuck to the gauze and there'd be the odd nun that changed my dressing and would do it very hurriedly and basically tear off the gauze uh, from my skin and the skin would come off I'd bleed it'd be painful I'd be bawling my head off it was really unpleasant however this nun, who I called the white nun, now all the nuns were white, they were predominantly Irish nuns, but she wore, this particular nun wore a white habit rather than the traditional black habit, and she used to use distraction therapy with me, she, she was very sensitive, she realised I was scared that changing the dressing would be very painful, and how she used distraction therapy, you need to understand I was in a very religious environment, 
very religious. So we used to go to church sometimes three times on a Sunday. And we were told that nuns were the brides of Christ. They were, they were very holy women. And yet this nun used to use words which I thought as a small child were swear words. I mean, they weren't. Words like bottom. But, you know, when you're small, word like bottom yes. is really, really, really rude, you know. And she would get me every time. She, she obviously understood a child's mind and how to make them laugh and distract them. And so whilst I was laughing, the dressing would come off and I wouldn't feel a thing, Lorna, uh, nothing. And that's my memory of that nun. And I later learned that she was a nurse before I left the convent. That's why she wore the white habit. Yeah. And I didn't want to be a nun. I'd had an overdose of religion, but I wanted to be like her. So I decided I'd be a nurse. And I never, ever swayed from that um, choice. And, I, and it was the best choice I made. I've, I've had a wonderful career in nursing. You certainly have. Um, that's so evocative. I can picture you peeping around the room to see who was on duty. Yeah. I, re I, can, I really can. And I was um, a very good athlete, so I could run and they could never catch me, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that will really resonate with lots of our students, because when we interview our students, we often get on to what is it that um, inspired you to become nurses? Why do you want to become a nurse? That's often a question in our interview. And so many of our students have either got personal experiences themselves of being nursed or a close member of the family. Uh, I think, yeah, I think a lot of us can um, will definitely be able to relate to that. And, and thinking about your nursing career, this is a question from me. Um, we're really aware still of the discrimination experienced for nurses from black and minority ethnic backgrounds today. Um, so I'd just like to ask you, if you don't mind sharing, what was it like being a mixed race nurse in the 60s, particularly in your in your earlier career? Well, that's a very interesting question, asking me about my own experiences of being a mixed race. Um, and I, I use the term black. Uh, I'm brown skin, but I, I use the term black deliberately. And um, so I, I trained as a student. I was a student nurse in those days. This was six, 1965 to 1968. The vast majority of nurse education courses were outside of the university. They were in schools of nursing that were attached to hospitals. Mm -hmm. So I was at uh, Paddington General Hospital School of Nursing. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed my, my three years as a student nurse. Um, interestingly enough, because of my childhood, which I've shared a little bit with you, and because of the era that I was born in, but it might surprise people to know that I never met any black people or any non-white people until I was 18. I grew up totally in a white environment. And so many of the experiences of uh, being pointed out in a, in, a, in a negative way because of my skin color happened in childhood. So uh, I, I, it, it wasn't, it didn't damage me, it upset me, but I'd had incidents. Enough incidents for me to wash my face Try, I washed my face 10 times once when I was in the children's home. And we had this rather rough, like red light boy soap or whatever it was called. And I had eczema, so I had a sensitive skin. So I ended up in sick bay again because I just, damaged, you know, irritated my skin terrifically. So I'm giving that as an example to, to just to um, uh, give a picture of a child that, overall had a happy experience in the children's home, but that I was the only black child in the children's home. You wouldn't find that now. My goodness, how times have changed. But I think as, as a nurse, we always need to understand as much as possible, as much as the patient or client is willing to share that is um, uh, relevant. It, it, but the more we know about somebody's background can sometimes explain why they might behave in a certain manner, why they are rather sensitive to certain subjects being discussed, et cetera. And so nobody ever talked about my father because my father wasn't in the picture. I'm sure we might talk about the fact that I did find my father uh, when I was 22 and uh, it was a very positive experience. But can you imagine, I, I, I now, 
It, did, it took me a long time to realize I was intelligent, by the way, because there's all sorts of issues going on. I knew my skin was diff my skin color was different to all the other children, but I didn't know why, because I didn't understand it. You know, I knew my mother was white, but it didn't dawn on me. Well, you must have got your brown skin from your father because nobody explained it. So when I started as a student nurse, I was I was so delighted to meet people and become friends with people that looked like me. I was very familiar with relating to white people. It didn't, it didn't phase me at all. I, I made friends very, very easily. And also I, I think I was starting to deal with racism a bit more easily because I'd experienced it. But there were some issues. Um, it wasn't actually until I interviewed somebody for my memoirs uh, who, who did nursing with me, Janet, and we're still friends to this day. She was the one who said she was very worried about where could I progress in nursing? Because she said, you know, you're intelligent, you're a good nurse, but will you become a ward sister? Because that was the initial um, ambition of many of us in those days. And she was worried because when she, a white nurse, looked around, she couldn't see any black ward sisters. Now, that is very interesting. I didn't know that she worried about this. And I think that's another thing. Sometimes we don't always know who our allies are. Yes. Because there was Janet. She didn't have, why should she be worrying about? But she did worry about my, my, my future because we were very good friends. But she never spoke to me about this. And I think that's a late lesson that I learned. In a way, I wished I had known about that earlier, that there, there may be friends of ours from a different background who are anxious about us because they understand the challenges that we might face. And I did have some issues. I mean, I, 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 my first problem that I encountered was trying to get into a school of nursing to do my three-year nursing program. Now, that sounds unbelievable today. But I, I filled in the application forms for three London teaching hospitals. Remember, I, I'm now back, I'm in the Midlands sending this 16 plus and I had seven O levels and they were good grades and so I knew I had the academic qualifications to apply the other things that they asked for was the name of my father and that's when I <laughs> I didn't know the name of my father I left that blank and they asked the occupation of my father I left that blank and they asked for a photograph of me of course none of those uh, teaching hospitals replied, but let's go back to allies. There was a, I was now working as a school nurse assistant in Wolverhampton. And there was a, a school medical officer who saw something in me. Now you have to remember I was 16, 17, a school medical officer was like a God and he was male. And I had, had much interaction with men because of my upbringing as well. Yes. And here was somebody who saw something in me. And he kept asking me, Elizabeth, have you heard from those hospitals? No, no. And one day I saw him get quite angry. I saw from his face and I was a bit anxious. He immediately saw that I was worried. He said, no, I, it's nothing to do with you. I'm annoyed at those hospitals because you'd make a very good nurse. I don't know what's going on with them. And he gave me the name of Paddington General Hospital. And I think he gave me a reference. I can't remember now, it's so long ago. But he channeled me to another hospital who replied and I got into that hospital. So look at that. That was my first barrier, which again, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't think of race. So I was very naive. I had a very sheltered upbringing. Um, later on, I realized there was this thing called racism. It didn't dominate all of my life. So, and I wouldn't allow it to once I became confident enough. But the next hurdle I got, and I'll just give you this as, an, as, as the uh, next, uh, the last example. It's not the last example, but I, I, you know, um, it was when I was a student health visitor. Uh, I always wanted to work in the community. I loved visiting families in their home, particularly mothers and, and the children. And um, I got onto this course. I did well in my theoretical side. And then we had our placement. Uh, we had, I think it was like a three, two month or three month placement in the community with 
obviously qualified health visitor, health visitors who we accompanied on their visits. And that was going well, but I was always asking questions. And I noticed that the health visitors, when they visited certain families, or well, I didn't know which families, but we'd sit in their car or in the clinic and they'd show me how they filled out their form of the families they visited. And there was one box they, they would tick with certain families and that was called the new Commonwealth box, tick, ticked. So one day I, I asked the health visitor, what, what is new, what is, oh no, it was called section 60 something box. So I said, what's this box for? She said, oh, it's families that, and she was pleasant. She wasn't rude or anything, but she, uh, I got a variety of answers because I asked so many uh, uh, other health visitors because of the actually quite ridiculous answers I was getting. So it was, it was sort of, um, well, you know, foreign people with funny names, um, people that look like you, dear, um, yeah, it was just, and, I, I thought, and I'm thinking, well, hold on, each health visitor is giving different answers to the type of families, so this doesn't make sense. Then I asked somebody, well, why are you collecting these st figures, these statistics? And none of them knew. I thought, well, that's interesting. So I found out. I don't know how I found out from a, another somebody else, and it was in in we're talking about the early 1970s when there were a lot of uh, refugees coming over from Uganda, for example, because of President Amin, um, and there were also the boat people from um, Vietnam, if you remember yeah. that era. So what had happened was that um, this the, the, the Section 63 was to enable monies to be given to the local authority to assist the health visiting service uh, with families who, who maybe didn't speak English, who were refugees, all, all the issues that we know that um, such families might experience. When I heard about that, then the next question, and this is the question that got me into trouble, I happened to ask it of my supervisor. So she was a more se much more senior health visitor than the others. And I said, but if you're getting money for interpreting, why, why haven't we got any interpreters? Because we've got families from Uganda who speak Gujarati and we can't find it. We're having to do sign language with them. You know, oh, that was a step too far. She, she failed me on my practice, practical side because she said I didn't have the, shouldn't laugh because it wasn't funny at all, but she said, I didn't have the right attitude to become a health visitor. Well, what helped me, because I was shocked, I was so depressed. I was, I, was really, I was crying because I really wanted to be a health visitor. And this, mm. this was like a bolt out of the blue. You know, you've been doing well in your studies, getting on with everybody, and boom, suddenly you failed. I was now, by now um, involved with other people in an organization called Needle. And it was sort of political with a small p, but it was from, we were all students or newly qualified staff from different parts of the health service. So there were dentists, doctors, nurses, uh, you name it. And as I say, most of the students. And we used to meet every month or so. And I told one of my friends from this group what had happened. Oh, he, was, he was so shocked. He said, I happen to know the medical office of health for your area. And he's, he's, he's an ally. He contacted him, the medical office of health for Brent in Northwest London, contacted me a little student, can you imagine, <laughs> oh, and asked me to come and see him. And I was quaking in my boots, as the expression goes, because I thought I might be in trouble. I wasn't in trouble at all. He said, tell me exactly what's happened, which I did. He said, you did nothing wrong. Um, I'm going to intervene. And you're certainly not going to be failed as a health visitor because you're the type of health visitors that we need. <gasps> so from absolute desperation. And the lesson I'm, I, I think if I can, I'm old enough in the tooth now to sort of give a few lessons. I don't normally do that. But I think the lesson I learned from that was open up when you face an experience like this, because I actually did get a bit depressed. And initially I was so shocked, I didn't know what to do. Then I got out of that and I phoned a friend who, 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 who put me in touch with all these people. And I passed my health visiting exam. And I think certain people 
shall we just say, had a talking to from their superiors about the way I've been treated. So uh, that's the last example I want to give you because that, that I will never forget that. It, mm. it shook me to my core. Um, yeah. There are some really key lessons, I think, from, from what you've just recounted for our students from all backgrounds, um, particularly around allyship. Um, and we, with, with us, we've got a really diverse group of students, which is just wonderful. And in, um, I work in our year one, and one of, the thing, one of the topics we explore is inequalities in health. And we talk about the role of um, socioeconomic conditions. We talk about ethnicity. We talk about sexuality, learning different disabilities and all of the things that might in, increase disparities for individuals and, and for us as nurses as well and for us as practitioners. And one thing I'm always amazed by is um, the amount of students who have an interest in being an ally. They say, what do I need to do? How can I be an ally? And the interest in students saying, how do I recognize an ally? How do we find them? So I'm really pleased to see that shift and that openness, what, what you said, Elizabeth, about being open and having these conversations is really, really important. And I don't, I don't think we do it enough yet, but I think we are starting some of those conversations. And then the other thing, which I'm just delighted to hear you say and advise our students is about asking questions in clinical practice. It's so, so important. If you don't understand it, ask, probe. Um, that's the only way to unpick some of these things. And it won't surprise you to know that, you know, there are, it, it's funny, the story you've just told about the funding available for the new Commonwealth um, patient groups that you had, really has parallels for me to the Windrush Compensation Fund. You know, we know it's there, it's sitting there, but how many people can we see that have actually had tangible benefits from that? And it's still tiny despite the publicity. So they, these things, you know, happening at the beginning of your career and happening in the middle of mine and at the beginning of our students' careers, they, they continue. So they still warrant that conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so I've got another, I've got some more student questions here. Um, and, and this one's about your nurse training as well, actually. It's um, a student has asked, how did you find your nurse training? What were the highs and lows? And what do you think, how do you think it compares to the training we received today? Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's a big question, first, isn't it? I'll, I'll take the first one and then you may have to remind me about the second one. Sorry, I might go no off. No problem. It's, um, yes, it's a long. So I, I really did enjoy my, my three year state registered nurse certificate training, as it was called then. I made friends that I kept for life, which you hear that from a lot of nurses. Uh, I, I've got a group of about, well, four that I, I, I'm still in contact with. And that's, a, you know, look, I'm pretty ancient. But you can see from my head. So that's that's beautiful if you can if you can be, be part of a friendship circle because you never know when you need that and also that's what life's about having friends as far as I'm concerned um, it was um, I've already mentioned I I was I had a rather sheltered upbringing yeah so it it was a bit of a shock a culture shock I can tell you to go from I ended up working in a rural area before I started my nursing. I was in Wolverhampton, then I went to work in a residential school for children with, with what do they call it? Delicate conditions, I can't remember, but um, it was in Shropshire, so that was more rural. So then to come to London at 18, um, phew, you know, so I think the, 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 the first thing is um, adapting. We, we were we had to live in, in the nurse's home for the first year. I know all those things have changed now, I'm sure. But actually that was good for me because I didn't have any problems about finding accommodation. The, the rent was already taken out of your, your, call it a salary, it was, you know, pittance, but never mind. But you had your food provided, you know, and there, there were things that were, I didn't have to worry about that I see from social media people. Uh, 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 so for example, the food was decent in the hospital, believe it or not. I mean, there was hot food and it was there 24 hours. And I know there's a big campaign now, quite rightly, you know, that the NHS should be providing decent food for their staff throughout the night and, and during the day. So that, 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 that wasn't an issue. Um, there, there were, there was always the issue of, uh, 
people who either look, look, and I'm talking about staff and sometimes the odd tutor, but that was rare, but the odd tutor, that maybe you felt looked down on you and um, didn't want you expressing your opinion, you know, and you had to sort of learn sometimes from older students how to navigate the culture of a school of nursing, the culture of a particular ward. And we would get, uh, we would get um, advice when we knew which ward we were going to go to, the next ward, we would sort of check out what's it like, what's what's the ward sister like, or chargers, or, or you know. So you, you learn to try and get as much information as you can. And I can see that from Twitter, funnily enough. I can see students exchanging advice, which is very, very interesting. So things have changed, but things haven't changed, you know. Um, I, I, I think why, why I enjoyed it, uh, my three years is that I am very, very curious. And I gradually got, wasn't so shy. I was very shy the first year. So shy that I would go into this sluice as it was called then. I don't think you call it sluice now, but where the bedpans used to be washed, can you imagine? Because I would feel sick with anxiety to have to meet so many new people. And again, gradually uh, I learned how to do that and hide my shyness to be quite honest and um, appear to be more confident than I was sometimes. But I think the thing that helped me and has always helped me is, is, is what people would call hobbies now. Well, they called it that then, but you know, I loved reading, I loved music. Um, so I think it's to find things that lift you up when you're feeling down, because you do, well, I certainly felt a bit down at times um, during the three years, but not very often, but occasionally. Um, so it's to work out what helps shift your mood and we've already talked about I think as we, when you feel a bit overwhelmed you really have to find the tutor that you can open up to and talk to and it might be that if you're a bit shy of verbalizing your problem drop the tutor a note an email you know and all what I learned from older students was how to approach very busy people um, for example, so I always remember one student telling me, Elizabeth, always preface what, when you approach a ward sister or uh, whoever, um, when you've got some time, would it be possible for me to, rather than, this is the problem I've got, like, I need it solved like now, and, you know, everybody's busy, and um, so that, that, and if you haven't been taught that, I was never taught that in my childhood, so you, some people are taught the, the rules of etiquette, if you call it, or whatever, um, with, or, or maybe have come from a culture where uh, there is a different attitude to whether you look somebody in the face or look down, or whether you you have a louder you appear to have a louder voice, and, and that's not seen as de deemed as appropriate. You have to have somebody uh, who, who can tell you honestly. Look, maybe you you're getting into trouble a bit because a b c d i think also you today would call those mentors wouldn't we they're, they're not allies they're mentors the people that you you respect um they don't necessarily have to be more senior than you but often are but they have more experience than you possibly and it it's it's to be able to listen without getting upset at what the person is telling you about an issue because that person is really trying to steer you in the right direction and try to help you. Sometimes it's a bit difficult. I've I've been on the receiving end of somebody giving me advice and it, it's sometimes it's quite hurtful, but actually you have to just swallow your pride and think, hmm, okay, let me think about this and um, and it, it, that person's probably right. Yeah. It's um amazing to hear you talk because in that question the student was asking around. Um, the comparisons between the training when you trained and their experiences now and everything you have just said students say to me on a regular basis really? um, and particularly the students who've just um, come back from their first clinical practice and we've got some who are on their first clinical practice now um, they have questions and worries and concerns about that social anxiety of having to speak to lots of new people and and having to come out of the sluice or out of the 
out of the you know the clean room or wherever it might be and, and and face that fear but also that navigating is really important because the NHS and hospitals and wards and community teams and nurses it is a different culture and coming in as a student nurse it's a different culture for all of us we all have to learn the rules and how to talk and how to conduct ourselves and how to access those really important learning experiences so I really love that you know when you approach somebody recognize that their busyness and 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 those those things those small things really help navigate your way through that culture um and absolutely find you know students who are more senior than you that are, are already finding their path and have got that experience already who can advise those mentors um and that responding to feedback as well um I think particularly, you know, our students have their interviews now throughout their clinical practice and they get feedback, constructive feedback all the way through. And when you haven't, you might not have received constructive feedback that says, you know, this part you're not doing great and it could improve on. That can be really hard. I'm a, I'm a sensitive soul myself. So I often find, oh, I've, you know, I've, that was a deep criticism, whereas actually it was constructive feedback. And I think that coming away and reflecting is really important. Um, and then the other thing that I hope the students really take away from what you've just said is about those protective factors for your well-being and they will sit outside of your work. They're the things that lift you, keep you going um, and um, music, reading, exercise, whatever it is, more important than ever as the NHS is under increasing pressure. So a, a wealth of amazing advice there. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, and this, this, this question, um, it's a long question, so bear, so bear with me, but I will share it because the student has took the time to write it. Um, and I think it demonstrates their underlying worries about how it's been being a nurse through the, being a student nurse through the pandemic. So it says, Elizabeth, do you think our cohort of nursing who've been disrupted by COVID, but also inspired enough by the NHS frontline to take up the career during a pandemic? We'll be okay when we finally qualify. With all we've missed out on, are we going to be good enough, competent enough, and experienced enough than the students that came before us? So there's quite a lot in there, isn't there? The answer is yes. You will. You will be fantastic, and you will be such a contribution. You'll have made such a contribution to the National Health Service, which I think most of us is very dear to us. And I think one aspect I haven't mentioned that has always helped me is reading. I think I might have meant to read it, but and, and I might sound like the nagging tutor now of students, oops a daisy, but it's the more you learn about similar experiences in history or elsewhere in the world, um, the more knowledge you've got, the more confidence you get about what you're trying to do and how to do it. And for me, reading was so important, but now you have the internet, you know, you have YouTubes. So I, you know, I'm a bit tough at times. So people say, well, they, you know, we, we have a family history of dyslexia in our family. So I appreciate that books are not necessarily the most, the easiest form of learning tool that, that people have, but you have so many other, I, I don't have any patience with that. I accept that, but I said, well, there are other formats. There are other formats that you can have. I mean, there, there's the, 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 the platforms that you can have and, and students know them better than, than I do. So it's, but it's to organize your time, of course, and, and your sleep pattern and all the things I'm sure you've been told about. But the more you know about your subject, even in the pandemic, one, development that's come out of the pandemic is what we're doing now. It's the online um, resources. They've just, they've just exploded. And, you know, um, we, we wouldn't have had computers at the university. Well, I wasn't at a university at the hospital. So we only had textbooks, to be quite honest. We didn't even have access to the journals that you have access to these days. So there, there is, uh, 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 as I said, there's, find out which is your best way of learning and, and use the platforms that... that, that um... So going back to the question, though, uh, think about similar issues that have occurred historically, not maybe at the same level, but I think of the, the, the HIV AIDS pandemic um, that, that occurred and the stress that nurses 
were under in that era and the stigma that nurses who were nursing the patient's face, never mind what the patient's face, we know that. I think we have to be aware that nothing is ever new. Now, going really back in history is my heroine, Mary Seacole. There you have a Jamaican Scottish nurse who made her own way all the way over from Kingston to London, had some rebuffs, didn't give up. What did she want to do? I mean, she'd actually originally come over to, to do some business. She was an entrepreneur as well. But she realized there was a need for the uh, care of soldiers, British soldiers and others in the Crimea. Crimea, look at that. We're hearing a lot about the Crimea now with uh, the, the sad Russian-Ukraine situation we're in. Um, but Mary Seacol went out to the Crimea because she knew that her experiences with cholera, with yellow fever back in uh, Panama and um, Central America, and to some extent in Jamaica, and now out in the Crimea. So when you feel stressed because of the situation you're in, and it, it is novel in the sense it's COVID-19, but actually you could look at other sort of similar experiences and see, you know, uh, nurses of the ilk of Florence Nightingale, Edith Cavill, Mary Seacole. We've got the history of nursing is very interesting. I think sometimes the history of nursing is made a bit boring. Sorry, I'm going to be honest. It's not boring at all. You've got a lot of women. I mean, the women as nurses were, were really in the forefront. I know, you know, male nurses today have got issues in terms of what they have to face. But historically, when you think of the role of women in nursing, go and look at the, um, the, the Victorian era and the Crimean War and all the role models that we've got and what they had to put up with, the discrimination of all sorts. So I think, um, look at the parallels, but also do remember that so many people admire what you're doing you know you you have a place in history you you really do have a place in history i'm i've been invited to talk uh, give a, 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 a short talk at st paul's cathedral towards the end of this month and that's a, a, it's, it's a concert that they're having in remembrance of nhs staff who have suffered during COVID pandemic. Can you imagine St. Paul's Cathedral are recognizing health workers. They're recognizing what you have all gone through. And it has to be part of your CV. My goodness, when you're applying for you know, five years, 10 years time, you were part of the cohort that saw us through this pandemic. So I, 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 if, I was, if I was you, I would have no, yeah, okay, you've missed out on a few things, but look at what you've gained as well. And those things that you've missed out on, <clears throat> sorry, oh, get reading. <laughs> and, other, and other ways of learning as well. Yeah, yeah I know you have some catch up to do, but you, you've got so much experience that others have not got. So I, I, I think it's, what does it swings and roundabouts? Thank you. I hope the students find that really reassuring, actually. And I think that is a, an underlying worry because their studies have been disrupted, because placements have looked a bit different. There is that worry of we missed out, but you're absolutely right. They're gaining different skills and new skills and, um, and, and they're part of a historic event themselves. They're making nursing history day by day. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a final question from one of the students here. Um, and, and the, again, the student is, has written, you can hear a worry in, in how this question is worded. I'm, I'm going to read the little note attached to it as well. I hope the student doesn't mind. I won't name them. Since moving to Birmingham, I recognise what a privilege it is to work as a nurse within such a diverse city. What work can I be doing individually to become more culturally aware and continue to dismantle any conscious or unconscious bias I may have as a white hetero woman. And then the students added a little note to me to say, 
I'm not sure if I've worded this one okay, so can you let me know what you think? I don't agree with asking people of colour to do the work for you in terms of research or educating yourself. And so I don't want this question to come across this way. And I'm sharing that because I think it's really insightful of the student yeah, and open yeah. and, and shows yeah. great self-awareness. But yeah. um, is there any advice that you can give to students thinking like that, Elizabeth? Well, first of all, shake off that anxiety because the fact that you've asked this question shows a, a commitment to um, health uh, equalities, equalities, etc. First of all, for, and this is for everybody really, I mean, I, 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 discrimination exists and it's always going to exist. Now, that sounds quite negative, but I think we've got to be realists. And therefore, knowing this, in each individual, such as, as the student who's posed this question, needs to ask, first of all, um, how aware are they of their own biases? And this applies to people from all ethnic backgrounds, all mm -hmm. genders, all sexual orientation. Personally, I think we all have biases because of the way we've grown up, because of incidents that we've experienced that have been negative. And, and we think that, you know, because an individual from that background who treated me badly, whether consciously or, or, or not, we think, when we meet somebody else of a similar background <gasps> and it might we might not be aware of it either of course but so i think we have to accept that racism exists um uh th th there's homophobia there's, there's there's so many horrible things but that's the world unfortunately as we so it, it, we, so we need to look at it from an individual perspective which this student is is, is trying to do and i think it's it's again going back to how who is it that we're surrounding ourselves with? We tend to surround ourselves with people that are similar to us. That's a natural instinctive thing. I, 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 I don't get too het up about it, but are we aware of this? And if we are aware of it, what, what other ways can we find out about it? Now, I, again, I, I, I'd be, 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 I come over very nice at times. I've got a nice smile and da da da, da. But I can be very tough if I feel that students or qualified staff, or any human being, is not using the resources that we have at our fingertips to learn more about people that are different from us. I mean, I find the television now, I find the internet, um, social media, there are ways of finding out. Never mind if, if, you, if you know individuals who might be prepared to discuss with you their own um, experience. And I think, first of all, the narrative is so important. So as student nurses, as nurses, when it is appropriate, in the right setting, how much are we finding out about the person we're caring for? Now, you know, during this program, your own student pr program, you will be having <laughs> all sorts of uh, lessons or whatever in terms of communication. Uh, the open-ended question, the closed question. So the best way to open up a discussion when it is relevant. And you've all got, a, you all use your common sense. You know that you don't start asking about somebody's background when they're writhing around in pain on the bed. So I think you need to know what you do know already and, and just not be too scared. And if you make a mistake, we apologize for mistakes and, and, and move on. We will all make mistakes. And if, but if we're too, if we're so scared of make, making mistakes, we don't do anything. And then we're not going to learn, we're not going to um, develop our relationships with people who are not like us. But you can, you can learn from a distance through, you know, so I, I learned about apartheid in South Africa, because that was what was affecting our era. Uh, it was the free Nelson Mandela campaign. And it wasn't until I read a speech that Nelson Mandela gave at his... Uh, court case that opened my eyes to what he was going through. I give that as an example, because that then got me interested in reading more about South Africa and trying to understand the history of South Africa. So it's quite a complex history. I'll give you an example today. It's got nothing to do with nursing, but it's to do with the conflict that is, is in front of us between uh, Russia and the Ukraine. I realized I didn't understand the history of Ukraine very well. 
and uh, there's been television programs and the stuff obviously on YouTube and all sorts of places that you can find it. So I think it's having that um, humility to know, actually, I don't know, I don't really understand what this is all about, but you've got the tools if you want to, to quickly find out. You, you're not gonna become an expert, but you know, for me, I mean, I knew that Ukraine had been part of the Soviet Union. I did know that. Um, I hadn't realized Chern Chernobyl was part of Ukraine. Uh, you know, and I'm like, what, what, really? So it, it, it just shows, we, we can't know the geography of everywhere, um, but when there's um, such distressing issues that we would like to know more about, we've got the tools. So what, it, what, what we need though, is the energy and the commitment. And, you know, sometimes getting a bit tired because we've got to use a bit more energy to find out about this or to know how to deal with that. Um, and I think to sort of uh, conclude, I think we've got to have confidence in ourselves to know about ourselves, to know our weaknesses and strengths and not be, not be that worried, but be aware. If we can do something about it, we do something about it. Because if we don't have confidence about ourselves, and I didn't have confidence about myself, look at me washing my face 10 times to try and become white when I was a child. That shows a total lack of confidence, total lack of self-esteem. And it, it, was, it, it made me anxious and feel that everybody was looking at me. And, you know, and so I had to um, gradually address that. I didn't realize I was the way I was doing it, but I did do it. And so I think I'm, I'm okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not arrogant, but I know that I'm not the person that some people think just because they are the color of my skin, if I put it that way. So I think there's, we've got to have this self-awareness, we've got to have this humility, but we've got to be knowledgeable. And as, as nurses, you've got to be knowledgeable about an awful lot of things. And well, so be it, you've got to. And how can you do that? You've got to study. You've got to, um, you've got to meet up with people who can teach you. You've got to listen. Those patients can tell you, teach you so much. If you, if you just have that right question to ask them or the right comment, they will pour their heart out to you, some of the patients. And you can learn so much from them. And then the, the, the experiences of the patient adds to the knowledge that you've gained from the university setting, from the books, from the videos, from, from all, all the formats that you learn from. And it, comes to, it then starts to come together and, 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 and paints a clearer picture maybe of the condition that you're, you're, you're involved with at that point or the unit that you're working in, et cetera. Thank you. Some fantastic advice there. I'm looking at the time and I cannot believe our time this morning has come to an end so quickly. I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed this chat um, and sharing some of our students' questions and really appreciate your generosity and openness in, in and, and support that you've offered to the students. I think Before they'll find you finish though, Lorna, can, do you mind if I show off? Because that's no, another thing. Be prepared to show off occasionally. Please, please do. Oh, do you see this? And yes, your Brit Award. My Brit, my, my Brit Award yes. from Dua Lipa. Come I, on. Yes. Uh, I think, uh, excuse me. So actually though, who would have thought nursing and the Brits go together? Uh, Absolutely. I don't know how Dua Lipa heard about me, but she did. She did. And so for Finally. the students who don't know, it was last year, wasn't it, at the Brit Awards, yeah. and every Brit Award winner was able to dedicate their award to somebody out of the music industry. And I was watching it live Are as you? a fan of yours. I, I was. And when Dua Lipa said, Dame Elizabeth, Annie Omru, I was just cheering i was absolutely oh. delighted i was straight onto twitter to see oh. the response um and um yeah you know we, we've got the power to change to change the world as, as you've demonstrated to us and, and be known outside of those circles and that was an that was that was to also illustrate to know what we're good at to know that what people value in us so what do we value about ourselves what do we know we've got to improve upon but why is it that some people like you what why why is it that some people admire you i'm talking to the students now so to, to, to shift some of the negativity and anxiety sometimes. Think about the people that, that really do like you and admire you. Hold on to that. 
Absolutely. And certainly the students can learn. We've only touched the surface, really, of your incredible background and career, Elizabeth. The students can learn more and um, they can read or listen to Dreams from My Mother. And I love a book that's um, narrated on Audible by the author. And yours is particularly lovely to hear you after reading it, after to hear you tell your story. Um, so they can um, listen or read to read that. And also, and I have sent the students the link, but I would urge them to listen to my all time favourite Desert Island Discs, oh. which is the one that you did. Um, because again, it gives a, a lovely flavour of your life and your career, um, but also an insight into some of the music that you love as well, which is really nice too. Um, so yeah, I shall just wrap up by just saying a huge thank you. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. And uh, I will share some of the feedback from the students when they when they listen to this interview. Well, thank you very much, Lorna, for inviting me and just to wish the students all the very best of luck. And uh, I really hope you'll have as fantastic a career as I've had and just en enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.